we will talk about the urban greening plans and we will talk about the connection of uh, Clever, that, the connection that Clever has with the urban greening plans. And we will have a excellent set of, of speakers. Um, we separated the, or we divided the session into two parts. There will be a policy panel at the beginning and then there will be a city panel um, afterwards. My dear colleague, uh, Helen Nielsen, will um, moderate the city panel and I will start with the policy panel. Um, it is quite an endeavor to get a policymaker in this time here. And we had our senior advocacy um, uh, person here work real hard to, to get a lot of, um, get political speakers here and it's, it's been quite difficult. You might know that there's a lot of uh, negotiations going on at the moment, very good ones. Um, but uh, in the end, we were successful and, and pulled together a, a good amount of speakers. Um, I want to acknowledge that the gender mix is not ideal in that one. Just want to um, acknowledge that. We tried and um, we got what we got. Um, <laughs> So please excuse that. I do not want to leave that unmentioned. Um, yeah, and then I want you to th already think about when you hear uh, the, the speakers talk about your own questions because both of the parts will have Q&A sessions at the, at the end of each, yeah? Yeah, and with that, I would like to invite Holger Robrecht here on stage. Uh, I will introduce you later, but so I don't feel as lonely here. Perfect, you uh, invite me as a first uh, for this homogeneous uh, panel in the beginning, talking gender balance. Exactly. <laughs> I apologize. Okay. Um, we have uh, four speakers today. Uh, one of them is Holger, which I, who I introduce later. Um, we will have Ben Cosper and Robbie Beaver and Mark Montleo. I will say a few words about them. Uh, when I call them up. Maybe we can already have them on screen. They're joining us online. Um, and I want to launch straight in here with, with Ben. One second. Ben is a policy officer for natural capital and ecosystem health with uh, DG Environment, uh, with the European Commission. And he's managing urban biodiversity policy and is currently part of the team implementing the biodiversity strategy for 2030, including the nature restoration law. Uh, we are very, very happy to have him here because it's a busy time in, in terms of nature restoration law. Lots of technical meetings already going on, preparing for the negotiations, or the trilogue as it's called. So, super happy to have you here, Ben. Thank you. Um, I Thank want you. to, yeah, I want to start with the first question here. Actually, it's two questions. Um, what will be the role of cities in the uh, nature restoration law, and how can the urban biodiversity goals be achieved in the face of rising pushback against nature con uh, conservation? Sorry. So first, the role in cities of cities in the nature restoration law, and then what do we do with that mounting pushback against it right now? Right, thanks. Uh, they're two very good questions, very different, somehow linked, I guess. If you have a nature restoration law in place, somehow it uh, is going to perhaps help to give some stability to the policy landscape. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll deal with the first question first. Um, I think cities have a, a massive role to play in nature restoration in general um, and within the nature restoration law. So not only um, in relation to the urban targets of the nature restoration law, but also many cities, towns and suburbs and the municipalities, they contain a lot of other ecosystems, rivers, water bodies, forests, grasslands, and of course, pollinators. So all the various targets um, within the nature restoration law, depending on how it comes out, uh, will have implications for cities or people living in them. Um, cities are where most people live, obviously, and they're the big drivers of, of environmental degradation in, in some ways. So there's a, there's a big role and a big responsibility. Um, and also city 
local municipalities have a link to their to the to uh, rural areas around them in the peri-urban area. So I don't think that can be understated. On urban targets specifically, um, while the exact text is not yet agreed, it's clear that all urban areas, towns, cities, um, and their suburbs will have at least to measure and monitor their urban green space and their tree canopy cover to some extent in the future. So there's gonna be a, a bit of a change um, of, of really, thinking about and looking at the green spaces where they are where your tree canopy cover is in cities towns and suburbs it's uh, i think that's that's a very big thing just in and of itself now we can already measure things from satellite data but actually making sure that there's a responsibility within local planning to to think about this and to compare it to where you were in the future and where you uh, where you were in the past and where you might be in the future is is going to be a big change now alongside this um all towns and cities from 2030 onwards will have to show an increasing trend towards what's been termed a satisfactory level for 2050 and that satisfactory level is something which i think um could be linked in an urban greening plan sense to a vision of the future of where you want to be satisfactory level is something we're going to work on a lot together with cities and member states they will decide what their satisfactory level is but based on uh using a sort of scientific approach and some guidance so over the next year or so we're going to be talking about what is a good level of green space to have in a city what is a good a good uh way to to have your tree canopy cover in the city etc so that's i think going to be a really interesting aspect of delivery and implementation of the nature restoration law. Um, and, and as I say, I think this links really well to the whole um, urban green planning process. Now, for some cities, for many cities, um, the NRL probably won't mean much of a change in what they have to do because they're already doing it. Some cities here, we're going to hear from Barcelona next, uh, and I'm sure that they already have all the different parts of an urban greening plan in, in play and probably they already uh, can meet the requirements of the nature restoration law. But for others, they may have to think a little bit about how they green their urban development processes and plans. Um, and, and I think the, the really underlying message from all this that I'd like to give is that the nature restoration law will give a big boost to the urban greening plan concept. Um, anyone who's gone through the process that you've described with the clever cities, um, will already be basically 90% of the way to having an urban greening plan uh, process in place. But I think that having an urban greening plan is going to be the method that helps to deliver your, your nature restoration law targets over the next 25 years. Um, I don't have a huge amount of time, one minute, but on your next question, how can urban bio biodiversity goals be achieved when there seems to be a pushback against nature conservation? Yeah, it's difficult. I don't know. I mean, I, I think these, uh, this pushback, these things go in cycles. There are political cycles of pushbacks and then there's no pushback. It pushes one way or the other. I think with the European Green Deal, we've been in a good place recently from an environmental policy making perspective. Um, but I think we need to try and go beyond and step beyond the, this sort of pushback one way or the other, because it, as soon as this type of incredibly important long-term issue becomes political and it polarizes opinion, I think we're not gonna get anywhere. So the only way to deal with this is to listen and to not take sides and to actually sort of try and work together. I think the, the point of co-creation is a bit about that, is that you, when you develop an urban greening plan, you develop it properly over time and you don't just come forward with a vision and force it down the throats of everybody, you develop it with everybody. And that's both both sides of the political divide. I've spoken to lots of mayors in my time when I ran the European Green Capital Award and the Green Leaf, and they all talk about the difficulties in implementing a vision. And it's all, always the successful aspects are cross-party support. So talking not just yourself, but talking to others, uh, co-creation and a vision that's been developed, developed properly. I think that the only other thing I'd say is that sometimes you do need to make 
decisions which are not very popular with everybody, but often they, they're later, they are well supported. So I think that's my six minutes. Yeah, Sorry. thanks so much, Ben. Um, and there are lots of strings to pick up here on, um, and we'll do that in the Q&A. I do want to uh, move on to Robbie Beaver. He's a member of the Bettenburg Municipal Council and a member of the Committee of the Regents since 2014 um, and is uh, there in the Commission for Environment, Climate Change and Energy as well as in the Commission for Natural Resources. Um, and uh, we've been working with, uh, with Robbie in several uh, opinions. Um, for example, two opinions on biodiversity, including on the biodiversity strategy and on the nature restoration law. Really pleased to have you here, Robbie. I wanna launch straight into the question to you. Uh, what role do you see regions play in the commission's urban greening plan initiative? And how can they tie into and benefit from urban greening plans? Yeah, thank you, Philip, and uh, also uh, good uh, afternoon, Holger. And yes, uh, I think that EU regions can undoubtedly tie into and benefit from developing urban greening plans that are strategic uh, initiatives enhancing the environmental sustainability and quality of life in urban areas by increasing the presence of green spaces, vegetation and sustainable infrastructure. All EU regions should embrace and invest in such plans, especially for three reasons. First, the environmental sustainability. Urban greening plans promote sustainability by reducing the environmental footprint of cities. They help combat air pollution, mitigate uh, the urban heat island effect, and support biodiversity conservation. By implementing these plans, uh, EU regions can make significant progress toward the climate and environmental goals, contributing to a healthier and more resilient ecosystem. Urban greening plans also observe and put in practice the European Green Deal policies showcasing the cities and regions' leadership in green transition. With strategic greening plans, we pledge to safeguard biodiversity within our urban landscapes, contributing to the ambitious EU biodiversity strategy. Our green spaces shall be sanctuaries for diverse flora and fauna. The second reason is the improved quality of life and well-being. Green spaces in urban areas have been linked to numerous health and well-being benefits for residents. They provide opportunities for physical activity, relaxation and social interaction. Moreover, green areas enhance mental health, reduce stress and improve air quality. They prioritize the well-being of all residents and foster healthier and happier communities from densely populated urban centers to remote rural communities. Ultimately, the design of those plans uh, would enhance the overall quality of life for their residents. Furthermore, our citizens have diverse needs and perspectives. Urban greening plans could extend across regions, resonating with the unique aspirations of our communities. And the third reason are the economic advantages. Investing in urban greening can have positive economic impacts. These plans create jobs in landscaping, horticulture, rural agricultural initiatives, and green infrastructure in development. Moreover, they enhance property values, making urban areas more attractive for businesses, tourists, and investors. These diverse economic impacts benefit our entire regional ecosystems by incorporating green spaces and sustainable features into their urban landscapes, EU regions can stimulate economic growth and attract both residents and businesses. In general, EU cities and regions have much to gain from developing and implementing urban greening plans, from achieving broader sustainability objectives, improving the well-being of residents, offering economic advantages such as leading to more resilient healthier and economically vibrant communities throughout the European Union. While uh, cities and urban areas are vital, it are our regions uh, that provide the broader canvas for these initiatives, enabling a more comprehensive and interconnected approach to sustainable development. 
our expansive territories enable us to implement urban greening plans that span urban centers, suburbs, uh, peri -over, rural and uh, rural areas, contributing significantly to the European Green Deal's objectives. Similarly, regional greening plans would allow to preserving and restore biodiversity across our territories, thus aligning with the EU biodiversity strategy. Urban greening plans at regional, at regional scale would ensure synergies in the local climate and environmental measures, thanks to their expansive reach and comprehensive outlook. Regional perspectives could especially guide the development of impactful policies. This would benefit a greater number of EU citizens and would lead to a sustainable, healthier and more prosperous future for all. So finally, the European Committee of the Regions, as the voice of regions and local authorities, is advocating tirelessly for the importance of implementing urban greening plans. We support their development, uh, are available to provide resources and information, as well as relevant contacts with knowledge sharing platforms or pioneer cities and regions. Empowering EU cities and regions to create, refine and execute their visionary urban greening plans is an essential task to the Committee of the Regions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Robbie. Um, and I know from you that um, not only are you in, involved in the City Council, you're also involved in the Committee of the Regions and you are involved in uh, civil society projects, uh, which is really walking the, the talk, so to speak, um, when it comes on all these, these different levels. So thanks so much for, for joining us with your, with yeah, your busy welcome. schedule. I want to move on here now to Mark Montleo. Uh, Mark is Director of Environmental Projects at Barcelona Regional since 2011, and at the same time, he's also Associate Professor, still um, publishing papers somehow with, with, the, with this job. I saw one paper on uh, carbon emissions from um, tourism uh, in, in Barcelona. Really glad to have you here. Uh, I'll launch straight into the question here, Mark. Uh, it appears Barcelona is the first city in Europe having produced an urban greening plan. Why did Barcelona decide to engage in this process and how is support for the urban greening plan locally at the moment? Hello. Uh, first, I would like to, to thank the, the invitation. I'm sorry I'm not there in, in person. So, and I would like to say a special hello to, the, to the, my partners and colleagues from the Connexus project that I know that probably are in, in the room. So hello to, to everybody and especially to them. Well, Barcelona started with a green urban plan uh, in 2013. We have already two. Uh, urban uh, green urban plans. That's uh, we are now in the second one, who was uh, renewed and approved in 2020. So we have the experience of having a first one, which was we needed at that moment uh, a frame because there were many projects, like for example, more more based in target species for recovering, for example, uh, species of falcon in the city of Barcelona, which is, as you may know, Barcelona, it's a very dense and compact city. So some of our strategies are really complex uh, due to, to the nature of our, our city. Um, we have no more, almost no more room to, to grow. So the, the city is established and uh, developed. And uh, the idea was to identify the, the, the important spots uh, related to, to greenery and biodiversity in, in the city and, and try to, to improve them. So I would say the first one was to establish a, a special framework for some of the projects. And the second plan, which is 2020 to 2013, it's more like a, a strategy to, to enlarge uh, greenery and to protect biodiversity in in the city of, of Barcelona that, uh, as I've been mentioning, it's quite complex because uh, it's a very uh, constructed city. So with uh, with the small parks, we, our biggest park is 31 hectares, hectares, so we don't have like big parks like Paris could have or London, um, and they are much more, more smaller. But we have the littoral two rivers that are, that 
they are not inside the municipality of Barcelona, but we've been doing projects along the restoration and recovery of the rivers, even in the Vesosa and the Llobregat. We try to work at city scale, but also connecting and knowing that some of the projects that we do at city scale must connect at uh, metropolitan and regional scale. So uh, we are downscaling some strategies like ecological connectivity with inside the city, which maybe it's a paradox, but we try to establish uh, some uh, green corridors with inside uh, the city that connects these parts with some semi-natural areas that we have, some uh, some hill and, and the park, natural park of Colcerola, which is uh, uh, behind the, the, the city. The main objective of the, of the plan is to have more greenery and more biodiversity uh, to conserve and improve what we have right now. So conserving and improving and doing it with and uh, for the, the residents, for the, for the, for the neighbors uh, in the city. So we, but we have to, to do it together. So there's also a special program which we call Hands, Hands to Green which uh, it's working in the maintenance of tree pits and some uh, urban parks within the, with the society and also uh, the urban allotments that we have uh, in the city. Now we are working uh, in some of the measures of the achievements of this plan. There are more than 20 actions which are then uh, downscaled in 100 projects, so it's quite complex to follow. It's a transversal plan, so we... Obviously, it, most of the people of the city hall who's um, maintaining the green and keeping uh, this green uh, are the ones who are in charge to to, the, to develop the plan and to achieve it. But also, it's related with other areas, so the urban planning area and also the transformation area or the the area who develops uh, the projects or uh, urbanization projects that uh, takes place in in the city. The, the challenge was established by the former mayor Ada Colau at 2015, which was to increase one square meter per inhabitant uh, the amount of green in the city, which is, I think it's, uh, well, quite difficult to accomplish, but that's, uh, uh, that's one, one of the main objectives of the city, but not also increasing the, the amount of, or the quantity, but also the quality. So we are changing from a more conventional maintenance of this greenery to a more ecological maintenance perspective of this uh, urban urban green that we have. Also, uh, we are creating uh, biodiversity shelters in some of the of the parks and trying to establish different types of maintenance and different types of uses for different types of parks. No, the ones who have more uh, old and uh, forest type of vegetation trying to do a different different types of maintenance and different types of, uh, of uses. Always trying to improve, uh, improve uh, what we have. Also, uh, as you may know, but uh, we mentioned it uh, before, there's uh, some projects that has transformed the city. So gaining, for us, it's important to transform streets and increase the amount of green in, in, in our streets because we don't have many areas to, to enlarge parts or to bigger part. You have to think that the, we have planned a big park in the area called La Sagrera, which is going to be the future high-speed train station, and the park will be on the on the top of the high-speed train uh, tracks. So it's going to be like a cover, and it will be the biggest park in the city. So that's uh, also, that explains the difficulty of enlarging this amount of greenery uh, in, that we have in, in, in the city. And uh, I would say that's at, at the moment. <clears throat> yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, also, there You're are welcome. lots of follow-up questions that I would have for this. Um, I do want to hand over the word to Holger, though, uh, our final speaker here. Uh, Holger is the Deputy Regional Director uh, for ICLE Europe and um, has been working for many years building um, several teams actually in, at ICLE Europe, including the one on biodiversity and nature-based solutions. Thanks so much for being here, Holger. Um, this is also uh, very dear to your heart, as I know. Um, the question to you is, uh, what are the strategic benefits for cities to create an urban greening plan? 
and um, what is the appetite for the engagement of cities in reaching the nature restoration law? So kind of two, two questions that have a lot of connections there. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, and good afternoon to all. Um, uh, just a personal word, uh, it's really a pleasure for me being in this session. Unfortunately, the three colleagues are virtually uh, in this room, but nevertheless, um, there are three male persons that nevertheless are very, very passionate about the topic, and I know them for, for years, uh, and, and I truly can say, as much as female, they are supportive to everything that is connected to nature restoration, to ecosystem services, and to biodiversity. So, in full respect to the gender unbalanced um, panel that we have here. Good. Um, <laughs> Philip, I think the, the urban greening plans um, are actually a strategic opportunity, not just for cities. This is an opportunity for multi-level biodiversity action. I think all three colleagues have spoken to that, but I would like to emphasize that this is an opportunity for cities as much as it is for nations, as much as it is for the European Union level, and um, in the end also uh, for the global level, speaking to the global biodiversity framework that we have. And it is connecting the different layers uh, of governance that, that we have. I would like to shed light on, on why I mean this. Um, a few years back in the lead up uh, to what is the, um, the COP uh, process in biodiversity as much as we have that in climate, um, in, in the lead up to the COP 14, which took place in Sharm el-Sheikh in 2018, Robbie Beaver and myself being there, uh, there was um, like a response to um, an international uh, science uh, report that was organized by uh, IPBES, the International Scientific Panel for Biodiversity uh, and a Global Biodiversity Outlook, and they came to basically one conclusion, and this is we need to bend the curve in the loss of biodiversity and, ecosystem, uh, and ecosystems. Uh, and they had uh, three uh, top um, uh, causes for, or, or reasons for that, and one of the three is uh, in, consistently in all the scientific publications the urban development urbanization as one of the three. The other one is climate and the third one is, uh, is agriculture. Uh, so we, we had to find a response to that uh, and um, then in the aftermath, uh, in, both in the European Union as much as in uh, the UN uh, Convention for Biological Diversity, there was um, a process developed towards response to, to this uh, request or to this analysis uh, from, from science and of course also a felt personal um, deterioration of uh, and degradation of ecosystems that we all share, I believe, and there's no scientific evidence needed for that. We can see it when we, uh, when we uh, move out of our, of our door every morning. Uh, but there was then the European Green Deal coming forward, and, um, uh, and Ben has spoken to that, the biodiversity strategy for 2030 that underpinned the, uh, the notion uh, and the urban greening plan uh, and the nature restoration law as sort of elements inside, instruments inside. At the same time, uh, in the Convention for Biological Diversity, uh, we had, uh, with support of the Committee of the Regions and their opinions uh, that were brought forward also uh, into what was called the Edinburgh process of local and subnational governments, um, we were basically successfully bringing the message uh, to the uh, UN uh, Convention uh, in, in, in Montreal uh, that we need to have a subnational plan of action. Uh, which is now the decision 12 in the documents uh, from the Montreal COP. What does that mean, the subnational plan of action? It does actually mean that there is a call on, uh, on, on nations to integrate cities and regions in the national biodiversity strategies and action plans, which means that if that is taking place at an integrated manner, uh, cities would be actually uh, an in integral part of the process from a to Z from target development or objective development all the way through to implementation and reporting. And there is no instrument in this very moment for this available. 
So that is sort of the uh, framework that, that, that we have. Um, then in uh, the nature restoration law, uh, we heard Ben talking about it, um, there are specific targets on urban nature, uh, no net loss, the implementation of um, an ambitious target on trees in the urban uh, context, uh, and also it needed, of course, something that uh, uh, supported this, this notion. Now, there are planners in this room. I'm myself an urban planner for, uh, by, by training, and we know that planning is basically insufficient. Otherwise, our cities would look different. So obviously, we have a challenge here, as uh, in the weighing process, the green parts of our cities are usually weighed away uh, in, in order to make space for other functions in, in the city. Uh, so this is uh, basically the starting point for all the thinking about why we need potentially an urban greening plan. The nature-based solutions replication plan followed a completely different logic and request that was actually uh, a requirement in the call that says you need to up and outscale the experience. And then Malmö actually was driving the nature-based, uh, the uh, Clever Cities project to think about a process underpinning this nature-based solutions roadmap. Thank you, Helen, for you and, and your colleagues. Uh, I think this uh, was a lucky coincidence because in that moment when the urban greening plan was coming forward as a request at European level, we had a response. And uh, by our doings as a project and ECLA as an organization, we had some opportunities to bring strings together uh, and uh, we could organize inside what is called the Green City Accord, which is again an EU initiative uh, for cities to respond on environmental legislation. Uh, we could uh, sneak in with Ben's support and leadership uh, a task on developing guidance, a draft guidance for an urban greening plan. And here we are. So the nature restoration law asks for something that is to implement uh, protecting biodiversity and preserving uh, ecosystems. Um, so this is part, uh, uh, ecosystems providing essential services to urban and rural communities, part one. Part two, the Green City Accord helps cities to implement legislation. Part three, the urban greening plan is a key instrument to plan, implement, monitor, and report. So here things come together because uh, it organizes actually the ambitions, ambitious targets at city level, but in response to the bending the curve in the loss of biodiversity and ecosystems, this is basically a response of local to global if we can say so. Second, a consistent framework for action to not have fragmented uh, uh, activities, interventions at city level, but a coherent approach to urban nature. Then third, to integrate with the other planning instruments and in order to give a voice to nature in the city, which is not necessarily as loud in other planning frameworks by means of an engagement and co-creation process and the power of the co-creation we have heard in the morning by our attempts meet people here on stage for what it means and what it does. Uh, and third, it organizes, of course, also the financing into it. So we have a very powerful framework if used. Uh, and I think um, and you asked about the pushbacks uh, part. Uh, I think um, if, if we look at what it actually could do for cities, A, um, it can help the place to be very attractive if the interventions are being implemented in that coherent and consistent manner. And we will see that people would like to, uh, to come and move into that place. And we also will see that there will be economic actors that want to invest in that place. Second, uh, the, um, the organization of the urban greening plan as a process before the individual intervention is responding actually very, very nicely to what now is, uh, uh, is at call in politics to reduce the bureaucratic burden and the administrative burden on planning and permission, which is what we hear also as argument for the pushback side. No? But in fact, if we take sort of the co-creation process up front, if we have the urban greening plan organized up front before the individual intervention infrastructure development project, 
it will actually not be an additional burden. It will be an information to a process and it will help to speed up actually the permi uh, permission uh, and issuing of, of, of a permission on a particular uh, intervention. And third, uh, the, the, the uh, co-creation process inside the urban greening plan as an inherent part is actually a contribution uh, to replenish the most important resource in democratic societies, which is trust in the democratic institutions and processes. So we have three very, very important arguments why cities should definitely look into the urban greening plan as a strategic, powerful uh, instrument. And I think we can, we can definitely say that in response to this short-term uh, short-termism and the delusion, as Eurocities puts these pushback arguments, which I think is very, very, very right. We need to drive the finalization of the nature restoration law. We need to be timely. We need to be coherent and ambitious in doing so to strengthen uh, local biodiversity action. We need to fight back the one of the third top causes that urban urbanization is undermining biodiversity, and we should definitely. Uh, implement the uh, EU's commitment under the Convention of Biological Di Diversity. Ben, if you hear me, definitely the city networks stand by the side of the European Commission and we want to see that coming forward very soon and we will continue our support to the nature restoration law. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for this passionate um, stand also for the urban greening plans and for biodiversity and nature in general, Holger. And thanks for all of, all of you again. Um, I want to use the last minutes that we have before I hand it over to Helen uh, to open it up for questions to the audience. Are there any questions for our policymakers, for Holger? It's not very often that we get these people together, so take advantage of them while they're exactly, here. Exactly, Philip. <laughs> Daniela here. My question goes to Ben, Ben Kasper. Ben, um, we know that, uh, yeah, if we want to have the co-creation processes happening for the urban greening plans, cities will need time, right, to involve uh, citizens and make this role. Um, and I'm thinking here, about the nature restoration law. Um, do you have any um, tips, ideas, when um, we could expect some agreements there in terms of timeline, thinking about, you know, <laughs> how the cities can drive, you know, use the law in that sense to, to make these processes happen? Yeah, I mean, I think the we're at a we're at the stage of the the trilogue negotiations they are at the minimum likely to continue for another six months i think if we're very lucky this time next year we could have uh the law in place but it could take a bit longer than that i mean we we've got to agree the text and then we've got to go through another legal process of checking all the words with all the sort of lawyers and legal experts to make sure everything makes sense. And then we put it in place. And even then, there is an implementation period. So you've got a few years, uh, definitely enough time to do some public consultation and some, some co-creation and at least to set a vision. Um, the, the nature restoration law itself on, on the urban targets says that there should be no net loss for cities with less green space. Um, between now and 2030, and then the, the targets for increasing your green space towards this satisfactory level is from 2030 to 2050. So I think you do have you do have some time. I mean, I think most cities have some form of uh, public consultation formats in place, and I think you need to just look at those and start thinking about those and adapting those if needed to develop a vision of where you want your future to go, uh, city to go in the future in terms of of its its nature and biodiversity and and the, i think one of the best ways to to do this is to use some of the networks that we have the, the good examples speak to some of the cities or listen to some of them there's there's cities like barcelona there's many many smaller cities the green leaf and the green capital you can see they've got their green greening plans are often available and you can see how they've done it and and 
there are some amazing and inspirational stories out there from our from our leading cities on how they've managed to get to where they are. So there's and and that's not just in terms of their mapping and their their how they're going to develop their green space. It's also in their their co-creation processes. Um, so yeah, if you if you need any tips or advice, then drop me a line and I'll I'll point you in the right direction because there's hundreds of amazing stories out there. Thanks a lot, Ben. Do we have we have time for maybe two more questions, Maria? Uh, hello, Maria. Ma I'm Maria Nicoledo from Larissa. Uh, I have uh, not a question uh, per se, but I was wondering if uh, you have any insight about uh, in uh, all municipalities, in any given time, you have some strategic thing going on. So, for a thousand things. So, I was, uh, um, I always worry when I hear for another strategic <laughs> plan or something mm -hmm. that. In many cases, the plan goes ahead as a study or, uh, you know, uh, a document, and then stays that way. So uh, this is uh, more of, uh, of expression of a worry of uh, how another strategic plan is going to uh, add on a list of strategic things that uh, are happening in the municipality. Uh, Every everyone, every each one of them, are uh, very uh, specific. So, uh, from one side, we have uh, uh, the uh, let's say the overall uh, planning of a of your municipality, but in actuality, we produce separate uh, plans. So, this is uh, in many cases very uh, difficult to uh, coordinate and. Uh, follow up with different uh, also local authorities uh, in different time uh, time frames. So this is I don't know if there are any thoughts or reflections I would love to hear. Yeah, yeah thanks Maria. Maybe just uh, one sentence at the background. Maria is um, part of a fellow city with with Clever Cities and and has done an excellent job in creating an an urban NBS plan as we call it there and that methodology of the urban NBS plants that we used within Clever Cities then uh, was also used for developing the methodology of the urban greening plants. Um, who of you would like to answer to that? I see Mark. Yeah, I think the question is, uh, I mean, it's correct. Uh, many times you, you end up o overlapping plans and, and strategies and it's not always uh, clear or e easy to follow. I. I think we we have to to ask for uh, for uh, indicators or strategies to follow up with plans. So what we what the plan says and what we have achieved and how we have achieved it. So trying to following this that's uh, that's very important. But I think they are needed to to be rethink and once in a while uh, because you have new concepts, uh, new ideas, uh, new problems. Or for example, now we've been dealing uh, with a severe drought in. In Barcelona, so water for maintaining green is going to be an issue, and that's not new. I mean, but it's going to be tougher in the future. So we have to 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 establish uh, uh, synergies between plans. No, so we have a plan for uh, using uh, groundwater and regenerated regenerated water from wastewater treatment plants, but not the not all the city has deployed uh, the networks but we need this water if we want to if we want a, a health green infrastructure that provides us with more environmental services so water is going to be an, an issue for the for the future for sure so we have to interconnect uh, those two plannings and not always all these interconnections are well done or well established or well marked so I think uh, that's that's very important. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have 30 seconds left. I do not want to take any time from the next panel. I, uh, but I, I do actually think that both Robbie and uh, Ben have a final comment that they think they'd like to make. All right, so let's do that. I think Thanks, they should Alan. be able to do that. Uh, Robbie, yeah. do you want to start? A, a very short uh, comment uh, uh, from, from the political side of uh, subnational government. I think uh, it's not only the top-down decision that the decision makers or policy makers uh, should decide uh, you have one very strong ally 
to uh, implement all these uh, policies and ideas that are our citizens. So I think that uh, one important uh, work to do is awareness raising, sensibilization of our citizens. And if an, uh, a certain amount, a certain, uh, not, not, not yet the uh, majority of our citizens is behind greening our cities and is behind and, and understands that biodiversity is uh, to, a, to the profit of all, then uh, you have even uh, the citizens that can uh, move forward uh, political decisions, uh, even if the mayor or the council is more reluctant to do that, but the citizens can push. So uh, don't forget uh, to mobilize uh, also the subnational and then, of course, uh, the citizens, because uh, that's what Casper uh, indicates. We as uh, locally elected people, we are closest uh, to those who can take uh, benefit of, uh, of all these policies. Yeah. Very good point. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, last words here. Um, ben, take it away. Thanks. Well, the first thing I want to say is, Robbie, the way you've got your background now is brilliant. The vulture is like sitting on your shoulder as you speak. <laughs> and I, I found that quite powerful. But it looks like it's about to go into your ear, so you need to be careful. Um, I just wanted to say that if you read the urban greening plan guidance it's very it headlines the whole point is that this is not an urban greening plan is not a standalone document it is an integrated part of the planning process that's there forever it's a long-term thing and the whole urban greening plan guidance is about the, the the governance it's how it's developed it's about setting the vision it's about having a political commitment it's about working with citizens it's not just about producing a few pieces of paper saying this is our map this year and we're going to build another park here that's not what it is it is about different departments government departments working together to make one urban plan that is greened so a greening urban plan is your urban plan and it's got it means the water department the transport department the schools department the roads and department they're all they all took working together with this idea of integrating the urban greening side of things. That's, I think, really important, because I think what the last person was talking about is incredibly relevant. And thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks for giving us those uh, two extra minutes. Um, and thank you so much for the speakers for dialing in despite your uh, busy schedule during these, these times. And thanks for the great questions. Handing it over now to my colleague. Yeah. Round of applause first. As you might have already gathered, um, my colleague uh, Helen Nielsen is with the city of Malmö, yep. working in Clever with Work Package 3, and I'm really glad to hear now the city's perspective. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, Philip, and thank you for a really interesting first half of this session. So we're now going to move on to, as Philip said, the city perspective, and I'd like to invite the speakers up on stage who are representing three of the fellow cities in the Clever Cities project. Santiago Sanaval, who's the Secretary of uh, the Environment for Quito. Ludwig Sunosen Bengtsson, who's a climate adaptation strategist from the city of Malmö. And finally, Anna Mitic Radu, Radulovic, sorry, uh, President of the Management Board for the Center for Experiments in Urban Studies, the city of Belgrade. Please welcome. And give them all a round of applause, please. And would you all like to... Thank you. And before we get started, would you all like to stand up again, please? Because you've been sitting still for 45 minutes. <laughs> so everyone stand up and give yourself a bit of a stretch and a shake, just so you wake yourself up again, because we had lots of pasta at lunchtime, so we don't want to fall asleep. Okay, right. So we're going to have a similar sort of structure to uh, the session before. So what we're going to do, if I don't drop my cards everywhere is uh, I'm going to... A bit more gender balance. We're not mixing, but we're, 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 <laughs> we're, got, we're balancing here. <laughs> okay, so if I'd like to start with Santiago, if I may. Uh, first of all, hello, and thank you so much for traveling so far and joining us today. Um, would you please just briefly introduce yourself and tell us about your role in Quito? I think it's already on, so it's just to yeah. speak. Sí. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Santiago Sandoval. I'm the Secretary of the Environment of Quito. Um, well, um, 
I think working in the environmental issues for the last 20 years and we are rebuilding the city and the ecological agenda for the new administration of, of Quito Council. So uh, Quito has been um, uh, without ecological agenda in the last 10 years. So we are trying to rebuild and link in all of the um, um, projects and, and project management and ecological issues for um, uh, keep in touch with the people and the court, court participation with uh, some um, social movements and ecological movements and uh, some politicians as well. So uh, I think we are doing um, very well in the last four months, which is a short time, but we have a lot of, um, uh, how can I say, um, strategies to, to rebuild the, the ecological and ecosystem agenda. Thank you. So my question to you would be, so what do you think are the main takeaways from working with the Urban MBS plan in Quito uh, during the Clever Cities project? And how do you think the plan will be implemented in the city? Well, uh, the experience in working with uh, the Urban NBS uh, plan in Quito uh, demonstrates the effectiveness of uh, participatory um, strategies and collaboration, uh, collaborative approach. Uh, it emphasizes the importance of the early uh, engagement, um, training and learning with, um, from the community um, to create sustainable and uh, impactful NBS uh, solutions. Um, additionally, it underscores the need the coordination of the awareness in building among um, various stakeholders to overcome. Um, I would like to say that it's very important to, to have the, you know, the collaboration of the other secretaries. For example, the education and healthy. Uh, we are wanting, working together right now with uh, that um, strategy with the people, especially in that kind of uh, pilot or case of study neighborhoods. So uh, the main takeaways from working with the urban uh, based solutions, planning Quito, learning the clever city in the last five years from 2018, if I'm not wrong. Um, we are trying to do in a reputation promotion, so co-design a a procedures. Uh, coordination and scaling green blue. Uh, from my point of view, this is one of the most important issues that we did. What we did in the last four months, because we didn't have um, a ordinance or, or a law framework law about uh, NBS and ecological uh, ecosystems uh, projects, and uh, uh, we found the importance of this kind of uh, law framework. Um, the population training is very, very important for us because we are uh, changing the decision maker from uh, the bottom to the top. Uh, we have the last 10 years from, uh, I think, a really hard moment for the city. So the decisions coming from the bottom, uh, from the top. Uh, so we didn't have any kind of participation. Uh, we have. Um, uh, impact in the uh, policy makers. And, um, uh, and in the last uh, months, I think I could f view uh, and find the, uh, the identify, identify our barriers and opportunities that we have for the future. Uh, that is one of the reasons that I am here, uh, trying to understand how is the Clever City working in in that kind of co-process, co-design, and uh, linking with the new project that we are in the agenda for the last, for the next four years. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to learning more about uh, the f what uh, Quito is planning in the future. Well, um, that is very interesting question because uh, we are building an ecological agenda, for example, uh, working in the biosphere reserve that we have uh, just one and a half hours from Quito, and linking the urban and um, uh, rural areas because we didn't have that kind of uh, link. 
and the sustainable and the developing from the rural areas are more, uh, you know, forgotten from the last uh, years. And um, the implementation implement projects from the blue green uh, ordinance, which is uh, green uh, infrastructure, uh, waste uh, water treatment, um, waste treatment, and actually we have a. Um, a well, um, how can I say, uh, 700 million for invest from the next two months in uh, those kind of projects. So we are doing infrastructure from one side and the other uh, um, rebuilding the, the policy, uh, public policy from the bottom to the top. Mm, okay, thank you very much. And welcome to my colleague Louis, uh, Ludwig. Ludwig, we actually work in the same department um, sit in, in the same office. Yeah. In the same office. We do actually sit in the same office. So this feels very strange. We, it's not normally this far apart from each other. Um, so could you also please briefly introduce yourself and tell us about your role in Malmö? Yeah, so uh, I work on a strategic level on uh, climate adaptation, green blue infrastructure within our environment uh, program for the city. Mm, thank you. And... So Malmö doesn't have an urban greening plan, but we do have lots of other um, strategies and plans and programs um, which are working towards making the city greener. So what would your recommendations be to cities who want to align their existing uh, plans and programs and strategies with, uh, on urban greening to the European urban greening plans? Yeah, and I think as was mentioned in the previous, uh, by the previous speakers, the, the guidance is a very good place to start uh, because, I mean, our green plan is from 2003 and back then it was very ambitious and uh, spearheading and everything, but I mean, 20 years, a lot of things happen. So going through those 10 steps in the guidance and seeing, okay, maybe, do, maybe we need to ensure new political commitments. Sure, everyone agreed back then that we should do this, maybe we need to kind of reinvigorate this question. Maybe there are new indicators we need, maybe we need to monitor in a different way. So th there's a lot of good things in, the, in that guidance that a city, even though it is kind of well developed on the policy side in this question, uh, can look at. And I think what Clever has done well and what I think we could do more of is kind of bridging the gap to other policy areas as well. Uh, so looking at kind of social justice, looking at equity, uh, looking at uh, diversity, these questions are very connected to developing the green, uh, green and blue infrastructure of the city. And so, for instance, we're looking at a kind of social vulnerability index for the city of Malmö at the moment, looking at, okay, what makes you more vulnerable as a group or as an individual to the effects of climate change and how can we use nature-based solutions to amend that? And that's opened up collaboration with a whole new part of the city that we previously did not collaborate with. Uh, and the same goes for looking at the kind of distribution of green space in the city. Uh, we've adopted the 300 rule, which is a catchy uh, rule uh, for urban planning, saying that you should be able to see tree trees from your window, live in an area with 30% canopy cover, and be maximum 300 meters from the nearest uh, green space. Uh, and that has also kind of plugged us into the people who are looking at, okay, which neighborhoods are in need of investment, where should we prioritize our money, uh, and kind of laying, overlaying the green layer over their analysis. Uh, so I think bridging those gaps uh, is something you could do even though you have a strategy. Uh, and thirdly, I think focusing on implementation is critical, as, as was said by a colleague from Larissa, that that's often where it gets tricky. And I think taking the difficulties of implementation seriously uh, and not saying that it's, there's a lack of will, uh, because oftentimes there is quite real legal barriers or rules that come in the way of implementation. And taking them and trying to amend them, I think, might be one of the most more important things you can do. We are, we are a post-industrial city in Malmö. We have a huge problem with soil pollution. And that's a real problem. 
but when we are doing green projects, it also becomes a barrier because you can't uh, use certain types of soils and everything becomes more expensive. So taking that as face value and actually saying, okay, this is very difficult. What can we do to uh, increase these barriers? I think it's important. And then finally, I think it was also said by in the previous session, climate proving these policies because they were written in a time when we had other expectations, so to say, for, for how climate change would develop. And things are moving incredibly fast just these past years. So the climate in Malmo, when the trees we are planting now are kind of grown, will be very different to what we thought 20 years ago. Uh, so looking at what species, I mean, to put it bluntly, will survive uh, is critical. And also looking at what species will become invasive and shouldn't be planted. So there are all these considerations that I think cities need to make, even though they might have a plan in place already. Mm, I agree. I think uh, flexibility is going to be something that we really need to be looking at in the future. I know, for example, the the municipal house or one of the housing companies in uh, in Malmo, they've actually developed a, a planting list of plants and species that should be avoided. Um, when they when they plant areas, just because there is a risk that they are going to become invasive in the future um, with the changing climate. So I think it's something that we all need to be thinking about definitely in the future. Thank you, Ludwig. And so finally, uh, I have another colleague from uh, a fellow city, uh, Anna. So please, could you also briefly introduce yourself and tell us about your role in Belgrade? Thank you, Helen. Uh, yes, I'm Anna on behalf of the Belgrade team. I'm representing CEOS, which is a professional association, which actually facilitated the co-creation process in the Clever Cities project. Uh, and our uh, territorial realm was the new linear park, uh, which is going to be constructed in the following years in the former railway corridor, uh, covering the area of over 20 hectares of new green spaces as a new ecological oasis of the city center. Uh, our role was basically to um, gather the various departments of the city administration, but also much wider group of stakeholders. So with the organized task force of over 50 and later even um, more members, uh, we actually came up with some um, very important conclusions, which pretty much redirected the strategic vision for the linear park uh, during the, the years that uh, we initiated follow, uh, implementing the Clever Cities project. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, we would like to really uh, build upon this co-creation experience and expand and upscale it uh, with development of the green infrastructure strategy for the city of Belgrade, which is uh, in being initiated and we will have the kickstarting on Monday next week when we re return from, from Hamburg. Uh, and we will try to use the uh, urban greening plan uh, guidance for developing this strategic document as well as other two programs, one for urban forests and the other one for biodiversity protection and development. Uh, and we would like to do it in a very broad collaborative process in order to uh, use the power of the community and the various stakeholders that we uh, managed to engage in this Clever Cities pro process. You've kind of answered the question... Sorry. You've kind of answered the question that I was going to ask you, just in Because <laughs> I was going to say, how do you think the urban greening plans can help foster the collaboration uh, among cities and other relevant stakeholders to mainstream nature-based solutions? Yes, well, I can elaborate more on that yeah, question, of course. <laughs> well, yeah, the co-creation is in the center of the methodology, so of course that it, it helps uh, co-creative processes. But I think it is really critical uh, to jointly assess the potentials and map the problems and define the visions. Uh, and actually in that collaborative process uh, to find new roles and new collaboration mechanisms and maybe to come back to Sean's question from the introductory panel about sharing the governance. I think the Clever provided as the example and the evidence that actually sharing the governance is also sharing the responsibility for the joint results. And it can be very beneficial and it, it can actually serve as a tool uh, for preventing some conflicts in, in future processes, which we evidence quite often in Belgrade. And I think that um, uh, developing green infrastructure strategy 
according to the guidelines for uh, urban greening plans, will actually be the uh, possibility to propose new governance models and business models and maintenance uh, schemes which is critical. You mentioned the list of species and, for example, in Belgrade we have a lot of community groups planting trees, but as much as they know. And I think it's very important to involve them in the official processes and to communicate and actually to make much more benefits of those um, ad hoc uh, initiatives and integrate them into a holistic uh, approach, which is like the joint effort for the joint benefit. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a question for the panel. Um, so how do you think the concept of an urban greening plan can actually support biodiversity action in cities? Often cities, they want to be at the forefront. You were talking about it, Santiago. Um, so how do you think an urban greening plan can actually support that? Well, first of all, um, for us, will be uh, very important to um, to implementation the blue green and ordinance mm -hmm. because we didn't have a framework from that. So uh, from there, uh, we're trying to um, develop in projects and, and, and strategies in the local territories with the with the people and. Um, I think we 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 took that step uh, first. The first thing that we did and in our administration uh, was uh, to build that framework, and then uh, trying to um, going down to the local territories to do that kind of uh, project. And um, this ordinance uh, could help us to. Um, to thinking about uh, the real problems in the in the local territories, because uh, sometimes people uh, we we have a lot of, a, another context from uh, you know the local territories. They think uh, the public service at first, and then uh, we are trying to uh, thinking about the NBS. But uh, for our administration, uh, NBS is the priorities to rebuild that kind of. Um, quality of life in the in that local territories. So I think that their strategy is is going uh, well and um, uh, building a new institutional framework as well uh, because we didn't have in the last 10 years. So um, that institution uh, or institutional uh, framework uh, help us as well for for to be close to the territories and the, all the the municipality workers uh, try to understand how is the local territory working on. Okay, thank you, Ludwig. I think it's uh, it's important that when you do these urban greening plan that biodiversity is kind of a layer you put on top. And I think it's a safe space here. So not all of the things you do within an urban greening plan is gonna be great for biodiversity. It might be slightly better, but there are such a range of interventions that some are very good for biodiversity, some are marginal. I mean, a street tree, sure, it's good, but, but that will not make the kind of greatest gains for biodiversity if you're looking at the diversity of species and the kind of diversity of ecosystem habitats. So making sure that you have that perspective when you develop it so that you actually have a range of solutions so that you can have a range of biodiversity within your city. And every city has very different kind of topographical and ecosystem uh, kind of predeterminants, which kind of determines whether you can work on biodiversity to the level you want or not. Uh, so just ensuring that you are aware that <laughs> biodiversity might require different actions than, for instance, greening a city for the health of our citizens it might not always be the same thing you do. Thank you. So, uh, Anna, do you think uh, you're considering a range of different solutions when um, you're developing the, the linear park, so considering biodiversity? Yes, we were considering, but I think that that aspect should be enhanced and it will be with the future biodiversity program. And uh, maybe I would now come back to Maria's comment uh, regarding the urban greening plans. 
and their connection with the nature restoration law. Um, I also understand urban greening plans guidance as a more strategic framework, and I think that we would need more discussion in the future about concrete, specific operational instruments of how to achieve it. Uh, when I, we didn't have time for another question, but I was thinking about what would be the specific instrument. You have the green space factor, and that is the amazing um, tool. And London is launching the net uh, biodiversity uh, biodiversity net gain uh, from November this year. But I think this is the pretty pioneering uh, process. And I think we would need, it's obvious that it should be integrated into urban planning, but how are we actually going to achieve that? I think it is a, um, an important topic for the future discussion. And we, we need to elaborate together on those instruments specific. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we can open up to the to the floor if anyone's got any questions. Any questions? Yeah, there's a question at the front. If you do the honours, thank you. There was one there, I think. Thank you, and thank thanks to all panelists for for your very inspiring insights in, in your work. Um, I would like to follow up on the question that Maria had and that, uh, Anna, you have uh, also responded to. Um, the, if we look at the strategic function of the urban greening plan, the next question is, uh, will it be accepted by the planners, but also by the polit politicians and the decision makers? So uh, regardless of what we do on the side of the doers of the urban greening plan, will it be received well? On how can we ensure that uh, it is taken note of in other plans? So the, the integrated function that we want the urban greening plan to have. Can you potentially elaborate on that one? Um, yeah, for us, I, I had a discussion with the, the leader of the Green Infrastructure Strategy developer from the Faculty of Forestry last week, actually. And we were wondering about the scope and the scale of the plan. Yeah, is it strategic? Is it a technical elaborative document? Um, and we understood and agreed that we should uh, use the, the steps and the methodology and, and then try to integrate it as a... Just, you know, like frame it as a strategic document to be integrated in the urban planning documents, which is a yeah, pretty holistic approach. But yeah, normally in planning, we don't have the implementation aspect, not that much, yeah, those are some special measures, how you implement the plan in the urban parameters, but not really about specific steps and responsibilities and partners and financing. And we are thinking of actually working on those elements much more than, than usually. Yeah, I mean, for, for our case, we have our general plan, which is for a long time contained these, the aspects that you take up in the kind of guidance. And I think uh, the coming kind of four years will be a, a great deal of work to implement the kind of restoration law and this guidance into that process. And we also have other documents, as you were saying, that kind of uh, govern the urban planning and integrating them there. But there will definitely, I think, be some political pushback for it being another thing to do. Uh, and so we have to be very smart about kind of not pushing unnecessary buttons and pushing necessary buttons, because some fights we will have to take um, and some fights we might be able to avoid. Can I answer in Spanish? <laughs> Can you translate for me, please? <laughs> Eh, es, es muy importante la, la pregunta porque en el caso de Quito nosotros tenemos diferentes, eh, digamos, un choque bastante fuerte entre políticos de una eh, de izquierda y políticos de la derecha, ¿sí? una, un gap bastante fuerte entre los unos y los otros. Y creo que eso hace una división muy... I won't remember. <laughs> Iquito, there is a specific issue in Quito because they have this conflict on uh, political conflicts on the right and the left sides, and then there is uh, an issue on this on this in the case of Quito. Eh, entonces, la vía que nosotros encontramos es poder hacer de una agenda ecológica, ecosistémica, transversal para poder unir estos este gap que tienes entre izquierdas y derechas. The, the way we found to, to cover it is having a transversal ecological agenda to... 
to, uh, para unir el, entre las izquierdas y las derechas. Yeah, to, do, to bridge and to join these two perspectives of the right and the left side. So, pensamos que eh, una decisión política mm, sí tiene un color, obviamente, el verde, pero eh, también eh, está dentro de un interés de la derecha o de la izquierda. Uh, the, this decision has a color, it's green, but it's also in, uh, it, it related to one side, uh, one political side, in, somehow. Y lo importante prácticamente es poder, eh, digamos, tener el, el, el trabajo con la gente, el, el trabajo territorial que se hace es, es muy importante porque muchas veces la derecha simplemente toma una decisión de arriba hacia abajo y, y se acabó el, 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 el tema, ¿no? And what's important to have a decision on territorial level because if we talk about politics, the, the right one has a very uh, top-down way of deciding. A, al momento nosotros tenemos una constitución que la cambiamos ya hace algunos años para poder hacer de este trabajo muy participativo y fomentar la participación ciudadana. They have changed the, the constitution. constitution to make the citizenship participation more, um, to foster this participation. Y finalmente es poder activar no solamente los, los servicios basados en naturaleza desde un punto ecosistémico, sino también de trabajo, que el contexto en, en, en Ecuador es completamente diferente, digamos, a, a Suecia, a Noruega o, o Europa como tal. Entonces, nosotros vemos como eh, la posibilidad de empleo, eh, productividad y conservación de la mano ligado de salud, educación, cultura. Oh my God. <risa> Sorry. And you make it in parts, uh, Santiago. Uh, what was this last part that you you saw this from the territorial uh, participation from the yeah. work of the, the sí, citizens, el, right? A ver, el el tema de participación ciudadana está enfocado, digamos, en cultura, educación eh, y conservación. The the citizen um, participation, uh, the public participation is focused on. Uh, cultura, education, culture and, uh, conservación, conservation. y salud. And health. Okay, thank you. And, uh, thank you very much. I'm not a translator, I'm sorry. I, have, I may have missed something. Thank you, our unofficial translator. <laughs> uh, are there any more questions from the audience? No? Everyone's waiting for coffee? Okay, I have another question, um, which I'd like uh, all of you to think about. What do you think are the biggest barriers or challenges to implementing an urban greening plan in, in your city? Um, Ludwig, do you want to go first? I mean, in, in a sense, it's, uh, a greening plan is as complex as a traffic plan. I mean, it covers the entire city, uh, every street, every square, every building. I mean, it's, it's massive. Uh, and there's going to be trade-offs in that in implementation because you need space. Uh, you, can't, you can't do greening without space. And the space is currently governed in many cities by cars and by other interests that are very strong. Uh, and so I think the biggest barrier, and that's one of the kind of the political buttons we will have to push, is, is kind of getting a mandate to decrease the accessibility for cars in certain parts of the city. And I know that's what Barcelona has, has done quite successfully, although they're getting quite a lot of political pushback for it now. Uh, so I think the barrier of how you use space in the city and ensuring that you actually work on that is critical. It's very hard, but it's critical. Yeah, I agree. I think the multifunctionality aspects of, of urban space in the future, so just seeing multiple uses of areas that might be greener than they are, but still being able to use for parking if it's for bicycles or for cars or for access for emergency vehicles. We're going to have to reassess, I think, how we interpret our, our urban spaces, I think, in the future. Anna, do you have something to add? Well, yeah, maybe I would just, um, yeah, I didn't mention previously that Belgrade actually does have the urban uh, plan of general regulation uh, of green areas, which was adopted in two, uh, 2019, so four years ago. And that is an urban plan, so that is a bit more of complexity. <laughs> and it is pretty well uh, elaborated plan. 
but I mean, in terms of general urban planning that we do have in Belgrade, but unfortunately not so implementable. And now we have to be very smart how to connect that urban plan with the co-creative approach we tested in Clever, with strategic planning that we normally do and will uh, implement with the green infrastructure strategy, and we kept that uh, notion just for familiarity with, with the wider stakeholders, uh, and to, pro pro to produce something that will actually involve wide stakeholders and be actionable and uh, possible to finance. So yeah, it's a really mixture of um, different uh, dimensions and perspectives of, of the document. And not to end up with a document that will end up in the drawer, which Maria uh, mentioned as, a, as a, a real risk. So yeah, it's, the, 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 um, it's quite challenging, but at the same time, quite exciting. And uh, we're happy about it. <laughs> That's great. Santiago, would sí. you like to comment? Yes, can you speak to me? I think one of the most that exist in Latin America is the excess of information that you have. You have worked a lot on information, but you have not implemented the information. Yeah, the biggest challenge that we have in Latin America is the excess of information. Mm -hmm. So that you have lots of information, but you have not really worked with this information. Y muchas veces eh, el contexto de esa información es con una visión, digamos, europea o norteamericana, pero la visión latinoamericana es completamente diferente. Yeah. Y ese contexto hace que el trabajo sea, eh, digamos, completamente eh, enfocado en cierto tipo de, de políticas. And usually the context of the information that exists is more focused on Europe and not Latin America. And this brings to? De tener una visión local de that it's missing this local and the, the local context to be able to work with this information. Así que el, las guías que se hacen eh, o las guías que se han hecho de, de trabajo de servicios por naturaleza tiene eh, que ser implementadas. O sea, vamos ya a la acción, a la implementación en el contexto, digamos, eh, de Quito, ¿no? De Latinoamérica. So the existing guides that exist has to be implemented at the local context. So they are working to, to be able to implement this in the, the, with this local view. Okay, thank you. Um, and final question for everyone. If there is a city here, for example, um, they like what they hear at this Clever Cities, at this conference, and they want to start thinking about some sort of urban greening plan or some sort of urban greening policy for their city, what would be the most important advice you would like to give them on, if they're starting out on their journey? I mean, it's uh, maybe not the most important, I can't vouch for that, but I think something that often gets forgotten is to look at what you already have in the city. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very flashy and interesting to go for a new park, uh, new tree, trees on the streets, but uh, as I said earlier, climate change will, face, will make sure that you face many challenges in kind of keeping the green you have alive. Uh, and so, so ensure that you look at that first, and that there is enough water, that uh, you know what pathogens might threaten certain species, invasive species, etc. Looking at that first and make sure that you make strategy, have strategies in place to protect what you already have. Because that will mean when you add things to your green structure, you will protect that as well because you already have those strategies in place. Because the, the worst thing you can do for political acceptance is to plant a bunch of trees or uh, do something in a park and then it dies and it's, it kind of shrivels. Uh, you don't want that. So start in kind of protecting what you have. So it's important to establish, once you've planted, establish the maintenance of them, as you say, is so important. I think often we forget, we plant, as you say, it looks really good, but then we forget that there has to be finances available just for the, main, the care and maintenance afterwards. Yeah. Um, Santiago, do you want to go next? Um, creo que eh, lo más importante que nosotros tenemos como ciudad de Quito es, es nuestra gente. Es el poder que tiene la gente para poder tomar política pública, hacer nueva política pública. 
the most important thing they have in Quito is the people that they have, the, the power they have to, to make public uh, poli policies. Quito es una ciudad extremadamente interesante para la inversión, eh, extremadamente interesante para el estudio geográfico. Quito es muy interesante para la inversión y para geográfico geográficos. Y especialmente por la diferencia social que existe, multicultural, en, en, dentro de nuestra diversidad. Y mainly por la social y cultural. Um, uh, Nevers. Levels that they have in, in, in Quito. Así que eh, creo que el es eh, poder asumir los retos que tienes con la gente eh, en, en, el, en el propio territorio. Al soberanía alimentaria, por ejemplo. The, uh, to, to be able to assume the challenges that they have uh, with the, the, in the territory with the people. Y, yeah, eh, uno de los ejemplos es eh, soberanía alimentaria. For example, the food uh, sovereignty. Sovereignty. Food sovereignty. Sovereignty. Yeah. Es tenemos a, a una hora eh, una zona rural muy rica, muy potente, pero poco utilizada. Entonces, los servicios basados en naturaleza tienen que estar enfocados tanto en lo urbano como en lo rural. In one hour from the city, they have a rural area very, very important and with uh, potential, but not uh, very used. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, final word to Anna. Thank you, Helen. Um, I would like to maybe mention a couple of points and less, as lessons learned from our clever experience. Uh, first one, in our case, we had the independent uh, facilitation of co-creation um, uh, dislocated from the city authority. And in our case, that turned out to be good. And from the first panel from CDC, they also mentioned that that sometimes work well <laughs> because um, from the local authority, sometimes you uh, get the um, instruction engaged, but until certain point. And sometimes you can engage in much more honest and open conversations when you are, have a bit more of independency and integrity, uh, just as a, yeah, our experience. Uh, and also, of course, if, if you're um, a civil servant, sometimes you also have the limitations, or institutional limitations of how much you can interact. Um, and the other uh, takeaway from our experience is uh, to have a locally tailored approach. In our linear park experience, we use the clever co-creation guidance developed by Polimi. Uh, but we had a lot of respect to the reactions of the stakeholders during the numerous events that we organized. And there is a poster and also the report, so you can take a look at the in the corridor later on. Uh, so yeah, we, we prepared canvases and we prepared some exercises and some tools, but then we had respect if they just wanted long four hours discussions, we, we gave them space for, for expressing what uh, bothers them. Uh, then the third one is actually the repetition of what Chris said in the previous panel, uh, find voices. And I think it's really important to search for unusual suspects and uh, to really find those bridges of communication. During the coffee break, I talked with Darko, who is now implementing the Linear Park. Uh, uh, he said, we have the problem how to identify the needs of adolescent girls. And I said, but you know, we talked with the ballet school from the neighborhood of the Linear Park and then the faculty of Def defectology. And that is not something that you usually think of when you try to solve, resolve the, the needs and address the needs. Uh, and the final point would be to try to make the good mix and balance between the long-term planning and the small-scale interventions and implementations. And we were discussing that previously in Clever, because when we have long-term processes as the linear park, which already lasts for four years and will last a bit more because of the legal procedures, the cadaster, the previous port, the conflicts between the flood protection and heritage protection, it is important to have small interventions just to keep people engaged and for them to see that something is really happening. So that would be yeah, maybe my final point. Thank you. That's a good final point. Um, I love what you brought up there about uh, not just finding the unusual suspects. I think that is often the case when you've, um, especially when you're in a municipality, you kind of um, you have your usual suspects that you always contact. And it's like, well, I'm engaged with the local community, but it's the same people every time. So you need to go out and find them. Go to the ballet school and find the, find the people that you don't normally, um, you're not normally communicating with. So I think that's great. So um, we're about done in this session. Um, thank you very much to our panels, both those in the room, 
so Holger and Ludwig and Santiago and Anna, and also our colleagues online who are no longer with us, but that was Ben, Robbie and Mark for joining us and uh, talking about urban greening plans and uh, their implications for cities. And thank you all for attending the session and for listening. And I hope you've uh, enjoyed it and found it interesting. And uh, now it is time for, as we would say in Sweden, fika. <laughs>